I am strangely excited to preach this sermon. Uh, maybe I shouldn't be. I don't know. Tell me later. Uh, let's, I'll start with some stuff you know. Uh, so the ocean covers 70% of the world, right? You already knew that. Uh, but did you know um, that the Pacific Ocean is actually wider than the moon? Isn't that crazy? You put the Pacific Ocean next to the moon, it's actually wider. Um, only 5% of the ocean has actually been discovered, so we actually have more of Mars mapped out than we have the bottom of the ocean. Wild. Uh, there are more historical artifacts in the ocean than in all the world's museums. That's a little creepy, but it kind of makes me want to be a pirate a little bit. <laughs> um, the ocean gives the, the, the world 80%-ish of its oxygen, which means like the tree huggers need to chill a little bit, actually. <laughs> Go hug some algae, because that's actually more important, believe it or not. Um, if you put Everest at the lowest part of the ocean, there'd still be a mile of water above it. That's nuts, isn't it? And then I also read this, this is the one that stuck out to me the most. If you took all the ice in Antarctica, uh, you could fill up the Atlantic Ocean. I'm like, what? Well, the, actually, the thought that pops into my mind is, who, who does the math on that? Like, what are you, what, a, what kind of, what level of nerd is sitting around going, you know? Like, and, and the other thing, we don't know. He could just make it up and we'd be like, yep, that sounds good. Yeah, cool. Like, I don't I'd never be able to prove you wrong. Speaking of, it is estimated that there are 3.5 trillion fish in the sea. T, trillion with a T. 3.5 trillion. Which is enough fish to cover Ohio a foot deep in fish, which is gross, um, like every square inch. Um, and if you divided all the fish in the ocean among the people on the earth, each person would have 437 fish. So in a very literal way, there are plenty of fish in the sea. There are plenty of fish in the sea. Okay. So we're, uh, we're in our series finale here today of our series called cliche, where a partial truth is a whole problem. We've been looking at popular cliches of our day. And the reason we've been doing this is because a lot of people take these cliches and they like make them principles to live by. They accept them as like absolute truth in their life. And while these cliches do have truth, they also, many of them have subtle but insidious lies built into them as well. So we've been trying to kind of pick them apart and see what's true and what's not inside of these cliches. So today, the cliche we're looking at is there are plenty of fish in the sea. There are plenty of fish in the sea. So... Um, you, I, I just want to say this. If you're married and you're like, oh, this isn't for me, I'm good. I guess I, guess I get a week off. Um, or if you're like, this is dumb because we're talking to the single people. Well, two things. First of all, the amount of sermons that get preached to married people versus the amount of sermons that get preached to single people is an even, there's no comparison. So the single people get one today and it's fair that they would, right? Okay. And all the single people said, amen. Oh, wow. That was not. Well, I, Oh, should I do this? Yeah, I'm going to do it. Okay, if you're introverted, you don't have to participate. But if you're single, could you just raise your hand real quick? I just need to see who I'm talking to. Keep them up. La higher, what are you doing? I'm helping you. <laughs> Look around. Okay. All right, you can put them down. So, um, but also, this isn't just a single person sermon. There's, there's some, some ways of thinking here that you can carry into a relationship that will really affect the relationship. So we're gonna, we're gonna deal with all that. So usually the place this cliche gets said is you say it to somebody who, they're just going through a breakup, right? And they're really devastated. Oh no, what am I gonna do? I'm never gonna find somebody. And you're like, don't worry, there are plenty of fish to see. Or it's like to that person who's been single forever and you're like, oh, yeah, they, they start to have this fear. And then you say it to, it's supposed to be a comfort, right? Plenty of fish to see. But all the single people are wondering like, why are all these fish, uh, jobless and don't have social skills. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, super weird. Uh, so I actually, on the surface, I don't have a problem with this cliche. I really don't. Um, if you're saying this cliche to say, hey, there's a lot of people out there, there are. Um, but what I'm really after today is not the idea of plenty of fish. What I'd like to explore, is there just one fish that's meant for you? Do you have a fishy soulmate? <laughs> Is there just one fish who will complete you? Are you meant to be with just one fish? And I'm gonna stop calling them fish now because that's weird. Um, so let's talk about this. Do you believe, do you believe in a soulmate? Do you believe in that idea? Um, so I wanna have a conversation. Like you need to, you need to, 
think about that in your head. Do you believe in a soulmate? Do you believe that there's one person who you're meant to be with? Do you believe in one person who's like supposed to like complete you? Do you believe that? Now I'm gonna say some stuff and you have to, can you give me a minute to explain some stuff before you just tune me out? Because if like we, we might disagree, I might have one perspective, you might have another, but can you let me explain my full situation before you like completely tune me out? Cool, yes, you're going to, awesome, good. Um, so here's, I have a question for you. If you believe in a soulmate, um, if you believe in the idea of somebody that you're meant to be with who's going to complete you, where did you get that idea? Can you, can you think back through like where that idea comes from? Where did you get that? Because this is important, right? Especially if you're basing a lot of your thoughts about love and relationships off of this idea, really important that you know, where did you get that idea? My guess is, if you're like me, you probably don't fully know where it comes from. But this is a really popular idea in our society, right? Almost every movie or song or book you read about love has this idea built into it. Really, really popular. So where does it come from? Now, if you're a Christian and you believe in this idea, I'm going to say something that might shock you, but the idea of soulmates does not come from the Bible at all. It doesn't. Uh, I've read the whole thing all the way through a couple times. It's not in there. It's not in there. Uh, it, I even checked like Leviticus and the boring parts. To get to, so that maybe it's not, it's not in there either. It's not. Nowhere. Um, and if you're sitting there going, okay, but what about, what about Adam and Eve? Well, if you remember, <laughs> when Adam and Eve were on the earth, there were not plenty of fish. There were only two. <laughs> um, so like, yeah, sure. They were meant to be together because they were the only one. They did not have a choice, Okay. Um, and they went, well, what about the rib thing? Yeah, because Eve came from Adam's rib. Well, I don't know what that makes them like rib mates, not soul mates, right? Like, I don't know what you're, like, I think it would be a really big leap to take that story and then say, well, every relationship is supposed to be like that one. I actually don't, I don't know that. And, and just so you know, like, as you read the Bible, if you read that story, if you read soul mates into that story, well, then wouldn't you expect to see it kind of play out in other places? And I just want to tell you if, you, if you just did a survey of the relationships in the Bible, man, they're actually kind of rough. A lot of the marriages, I don't know if you saw like Abraham and Sarah. Yeah, that was cute for a while. But then like one day Abraham like asks her to pretend to be a sister so some guys don't beat him up and take her. Can you imagine the ride home after that? Right? You're driving through a dangerous neighborhood. Tell them you're my sister. Like we're not, we're not talking for a while after that, right? Uh, Isaac and Rebecca, man, they pick favorite kids and then they pitted them against each other. Jacob had multiple wives and his life was a mess. What do you want to use David as an example? You can't use David as an example. What about Solomon? Dude had 300 wives and 700 concubines. Did he have a soulmate? Well, he was still looking, right? He never found her. Look through, if you just did a survey of the Bible over relationships, you're not really going to find the idea of a soulmate. You're not going to find it anywhere in there. And if it didn't come from the Bible, then where did it come from? Oh, oh, well, I can't wait to tell you. So, uh, have you heard of the ancient philosopher Plato, Greek philosopher, about 2,400 years ago? And if you're not like, who, Plato, what do you do? Okay, you know the, the myths that have Zeus and Poseidon and all of them? He was, he was one of those guys. So, um, he wrote some stories, stories. And one of them was this. He wrote that humans were originally spherical creatures, with two faces, four arms, four legs, and a single torso. You got, you got a good imagination? Did you just imagine this? Okay. They were powerful and ambitious. <laughs> so they got four arms and four legs. Of course, they were powerful and ambitious. Uh, possessing the ability to build great strength and accomplish remarkable feats. They were whole and self-sufficient, living in harmony within themselves, for, uh, possessing a profound sense of unity and completeness. Okay? And here you sit with two arms and two legs and one face like an idiot. <laughs> well, how dumb do you look right now, right? Um, uh, so these original humans, the spherical, four-armed, four-legged, uh, two-faced humans, they posed evidently a threat to the gods. So Zeus, king of the gods, decided to split each human in half, creating two separate individuals to weaken them so they would not be able to you know, do some kind of uprising against the gods. So every whole human was split into halves, and then um, following the split, each half experienced this innate sense of loss and incompleteness. They yearned to find their other half to uh, get back to their original unified state. 
So they spent their lives searching for that missing other half. Plato made this up 2,400 years ago. Fictional story. You know, like Batman or Lilo and Stitch. That's what this is. So, if I may, I just want to ask, do you really want to base your entire philosophy of love and relationships based off of a fictional story? Do you, should, do you, want, to, do you want to give it that much weight? Because if you want to say, I still believe in soulmates, then you probably should believe in Zeus and Poseidon. You should probably believe that you were originally a four-armed, four-legged, two-faced, freakishly weird, whatever that is, okay? But if you don't want to believe in all that, then you should definitely question this idea of soulmates. So that was its origins. And then let's at least just kind of grade this idea from how useful it is. Because here's my problem with it. If you believe in a soulmate, if you believe in the one, you believe that you're looking for very specifically one other person, right? You're looking for one other person that you're supposed to spend the rest of your life with. But we don't leave it at that, right? Like we have a whole bunch of ideas of what that means and what that would look like, right? Because your assumption is if I find that right person, everything's gonna feel right, right? Everything's gonna go right. And everything's gonna be all right. Everything's going to be right. You assume if you find the right person, all that's going to happen. You're going to feel a certain kind of way and things are going to go a certain kind of way. And you assume if you find that person, you assume that love with that person is just going to come easy. It's just going to come easy. Because if they're my soulmate, if we're supposed to just click together, this is just going to come easy, easy. And here's the thing, if you think about it, when you first meet somebody and you like them for a while, it does go all right, right? I mean, that's the only reason you're together in the first place, it's right, it feels great, he's great, she's great, there's excitement, there's expectation, he's intentional, she's frisky, all that stuff, you know, there's kids, um, all that stuff, all that stuff, there is kids eventually, right? Like all that stuff, it feels right. He must be the one, she must be the one. So you're together for a while. And then you experience some, some friction. You call it a disagreement because you don't want to call it a fight. You know, soulmates don't fight. <laughs> We're just having a disagreement here. You know, you get through it. And you're not naive enough to believe that there would not be anything like that. So you don't, you're not like done yet. But it did plant a question in your mind. Your, your antenna go up and you're starting to pay attention. A question starts to form in your mind. And then say you have another disagreement and another disagreement and it starts to become hard to call them disagreements because they don't feel like disagreements anymore. And then something happens in here because when you first were together, you felt like this fullness, like you were filled up by this relationship, like your soul just felt this, this happiness, this satisfaction. But then as you go and you have these disagreements and things, you know, he's not as intentional and she's not as whatever. And then um, you're like looking inside going, ah, I'm just not feeling the same. You start to look inside and that question starts to, to crystallize in your mind. The question that is the relationship killer, the question that is the beginning of the end, the question that will cause you to slowly start to pull away, the question is, well, what if he's not the one? What if she's not my soulmate? What if we're not meant to be together? And as you, once you allow yourself to start asking that question, every single thing that happens in the relationship starts to become a piece of your answer to that question. Every fight you have is a piece of your answer. Every time he does something that annoys you, every time she does something that, that irritates you, every time he leaves his socks next to the hamper instead of in the hamper, right? Every time all those little things happen, you use that as evidence to your answer to the question, what if we're not meant to be together? And eventually... You allow yourself to internally answer it. Because if this person was the one, it wouldn't be this hard. 
it wouldn't be this hard. If this person were my soulmate, we wouldn't have to work this hard. If this person was the one who completes me, it wouldn't feel like this. I wouldn't feel empty right now. And then, if you allow yourself to think all those things, it's real easy for you to make a tiny little leap from, well, if this person isn't the one, then the one must still be out there. I, 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 there's a person out there who all this stuff wouldn't be happening with. And then there's a little, almost a little bit of a panic, a little bit of a fear of missing out. Like I'm, I'm wasting my time with this person because there's another person out there where this won't happen with. And that's it. That's all you need. Because then you almost convince yourself that you're doing each other a favor. Well, if you're not the one and I'm not the one, we better go, we better both go find our, our ones. And you relinquish all responsibility for the health of relationship. And it's over. And it's over. So you quit. And you go out and you keep searching for that other half. Um, and you'll be doing that for the rest of your life. So can I make, I want to make, that's, that's the way the story goes sometimes. Can I make a completely counter statement? And it's going to be uh, maybe offensive at first. Okay, maybe offensive. Push through with me again. Just let me explain. But at first it's going to smack you in the face a little bit, especially if you're sitting next to somebody who you love. Um, so here's my statement. You ready? You never marry the right person. You never marry the right person. Never marry the right person. Now, squeeze their hand right now. Isn't that warm fuzzy? I had somebody here on Thursday who was like their wedding anniversary. They were like, thanks for that, Pastor. That's so nice. So encouraging. Mm. But here, let me, let me explain. Let me explain. So there's three areas where if you think they're the right person, it kind of comes out. It's in conflict, compatibility, and we'll call it completion because I want the alliteration points. Pastors get alliteration points. So com uh, conflict, compatibility, and completion. And if you believe that they're the right person, you have some assumptions around these three things. So first, let's deal with conflict. You have this assumption, if I find the right one, you know, if I find the right fish out of all the fish in the whole sea, then um, it won't be difficult, right? Love will come easy. Relationships should just flow. Bumps in the road, sure, but roadblocks, no way. Getting to a point in the road where the road is washed out by a flood, that wouldn't happen if you were my soulmate. And you have, if you believe in the one, you have an unspoken assumption about how much conflict you would have with the one. You do. I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, but if you believe in a soulmate, you have this assumption that there would be this level of conflict and no more. You might not have ever articulated it before. You may not have even thought it out loud, but you have an expectation. So let me, let me show you a verse here. It'll help with some expectations here. It's Romans 3.23. If you've been a Christian for a while, you've heard this one before. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Everyone has sinned. That's the Bible's way of saying nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. Every single person on the planet has stuff, has issues, has hang-ups, has bad habits. Uh, we all have selfishness and anger and greed and lust. All that stuff. We all got stuff. Every single person. You. You have stuff. You call it, uh, in the relational terms, what do we call that? We call that baggage, right? You got baggage. You're bringing something into a relationship. You're bringing your hangups. You're bringing your habits. You're bringing all that stuff inside of you. You bring it to the relationship. You do. You do. And so does the person you're thinking about dating. And so does the person you're married to. They got their own stuff, their own baggage, their own mess. So you're both bringing this stuff into the relationship. So I have an, an equation for you. Uh, now I didn't love math in school. I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it. I actually made it to pre-calculus in college, and I am weirdly proud of that. That's, I was excited that I made it that far. Now that was it, though, because in pre-calculus, every week builds on the lead week before. I remember the exact week where I was like, oh, I, I'm done here. <laughs> we, we, 
I reached math peak for me. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I limped my way through that class, and then that was, that was it. And I felt pretty good about it until now my second grader is bringing math home, and it's wild. It is wild because, like, I know the answers, but I have no idea how they're asking him to get them now. And, like, I'm fighting with my second grader about his math homework now. Um, and if you don't know my youngest son, he's got a little bit of a mouth on him, just a little, little bit. Um, so he will, he will talk back to me because he gets home, and I help him with his homework. And like, I'll be like, buddy, I, I like know the answer, but I don't know how they're asking you to get. So he'll get a little frustrated and he mouths off to me and I mouth off to him. Um, and one day we were working on something. And I'm like, ah, I just don't know. And like, I was like, just try it. And he was angrily like working through it. And he turned the paper around and I was like, that's it. You got it. And he goes, boom, in your face. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> like, it's the weirdest good feeling I've ever had. <laughs> like trash talking about us getting your homework right. All right, whatever. Um, so that's where I'm at with math. Now, I don't know where you're at with math, but wherever you're at, I think you'll be able to get this equation. This is not a complicated equation. I think you'll see that this makes sense. So here it is. One sinner plus one sinner does not equal zero conflict. Does that make, any, even if you're at the second grade level, you're like, yep, that, that totally makes, one sinner plus one sinner does not equal zero conflict. If you live in close proximity to another human being, you're gonna have conflict, you will. We need to get rid of this Disney princess, happily ever after idea. And I know if you grew up with that, I did too. And like you have this expert, you see the whole movie has conflict. And at the end, it's like the conflict ends. And that's the way a good story goes, right? You have, a, you have this, this peak of like, what's gonna happen? And then boom, it's solved. And then happily ever after, right? And the assumption is that there is no conflict, but I don't want to spoil it for you. But listen, after Beauty and the Beast got married, beasts still act like a beast sometimes. <laughs> they did. Uh, when, when Jasmine and Aladdin got married, Aladdin still acted like a street rat sometimes. He did. He did. Uh, Snow White and whatever nameless prince she married, I don't remember. What was his name? Oh, Charming. Wasn't that all of them? <laughs> not ever. Well, Snow White even after they got married, she slept too much, okay? She slept too much. And uh, Rapunzel and what, Flynn? Uh, Rapunzel never got over her trust issues, right? So like, think about that. You have this, all these things, we've allowed these things to influence the way we think about relationships. We have this 2,400 year old myth about spherical, four-armed, four-legged humans. You have all these Disney movies telling you that if you find the one, you're gonna live happily ever after. You have all these assumptions built into your relationship. And they're not true. You gotta drop this idea that if you find the right one, you won't have conflict. It's not true. You gotta drop this idea that everything's gonna come easy if you find the right one. It's not true. You're a sinner, they're a sinner. You're gonna have conflict. So the best idea, instead of just looking for a conflict-free relationship, you could search for that for the rest of your life, better would be to say, I'm gonna try and get good at conflict. I'm gonna get really good at resolving conflict. We're gonna work through this stuff. That would be a better way to think about relationships. Now, you might be sitting there going, I knew, I didn't expect not to have conflict, pastor, come on now. Like I'm a little more mature than that. What about this idea of compatibility though, right? I should be compatible with the person I'm gonna spend the rest of my life with, right? We need to like the same things, mostly hate the same things, mostly right? Very similar tastes in food and movies and vacation spots and all that, right? We're, we're, if we're not compatible, then we're not soulmates. We should be two puzzle pieces that fit very nicely together, right? All right. That's a nice idea. Here's my problem with that. One of my problems with that. The person you marry on the day you marry them will not be the same person a year later. Do you know that? The person you marry, the day you marry, a year later, they're going to be different. And then, then seven years later, they're going to be even different, right? Seven, you know, seven years is a big year for relationships. I don't know. They call it seven-year itch. Ooh, that's because people change. Year seven, they're very different. Year 10, they're different. Year 20, they're different. They change. People change. I am not the same person that my wife married 20 years ago. Thank God she would say amen to that, right? She is not the same person that I married 20 years ago. And one of the things I've learned in 20 years is I'm not going to say thank God to that. <laughs> right? I'm not going to do that. Actually, my wife has not aged at all. It's a little weird. If you look at our wedding pictures, she looks exactly the same. I think she might be some kind of beautiful vampire. I don't know. I haven't figured it out yet. 
uh, I'm, I very much enjoy it. But we change. We change, okay? Loving her is like aiming at a moving target, okay? Loving me is like her trying to aim at a moving target. And you need to realize that, think about that, just from a surface relationship level, tastes change, habits change, likes and dislikes change. The person who you say I do to is not going to be the same person years later. Your compatibility level on day one is not set. It's going to change. There's going to be highs and lows. There's going to be times where you feel like you're really in sync and times where you're not. Matter of fact, for the Christian, if you're a Christian, change isn't even optional. You, you're, you, you are going to change as a Christian. Look at uh, Colossians 3.10. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. That verse kind of drips with change, doesn't it? It's an expectation that a Christian, you're, as the years go by, you are going to be renewed. Your whole nature is going to change. You're going to become more like your creator. You're going to change. Which means when you said your vows on whatever day that was, and you said, till death do us part. You were saying that to a dynamic person where you were, you were going to promise to love them for the rest of your life, and that meant you're going to love a moving target. You're going to love a moving target. Because maybe you were compatible day one, but what about day 1,000? What about day 10,000? Maybe you were but you live a couple of years, you change. And if you keep this whole idea of soulmates, what you're going to do, I know what you're going to do. You're going you're to get married. You were compatible. Of course you were compatible. You wouldn't have said I do if you weren't. And then if you have this idea of soulmates and you get a year in and you get five years in and you get 10 years in and all of a sudden you feel like you've drifted apart, you feel like, well, you used to and you used to and we used to be compatible and now we're not, you're going to let the thought creep in that goes, well, if we were soulmates though... We wouldn't, you don't drift apart. Soulmates don't drift apart. They click together. Soulmates don't, don't lose compatibility over the years. And then you'll make the decision to say, well, if we're not still compatible, maybe I need to find somebody that I am compatible with. This idea curses you into forever finding someone who's compatible with the current you, right? The current you. The current you. And it ends up making you treat relationships like, like cars. And it's a weird thing, but it's eerily similar to the way people treat relationships. You get a new car, and you freaking love it, right? It's, you, it's amazing. I love this new car. It smells nice on the inside, right? Comfortable. It's got all the new g gadgets and all that stuff, all the technology that as you get older, you're like, I don't even know if I know how to use all of it. Why do I not have a key now? My car starts with a button. I still think that's a little weird. Um, and you love all this. And if you got a new car that you really love, you're weird and you like walk out to your window and you like look out at your new car and you're like, hey, there it is, right? Like, have you ever done that? I've done that. But then you drive it for a while and it doesn't smell new anymore. If you have kids, that's about a week, right? It's, it's gone, it's gone. Uh, gets dirty, dirty to the point that you can't really clean it all the way anymore. It gets some dents in it, it gets some miles on it. And then you start to have that thought, ah, I mean, I like it, but... And then you finally get to the point where you're like, I'm done with this one, I need a new one. And it's weird how eerily similar that is to the way some people treat relationships. They like it at first, they understand that there's gonna be this, this high at first, and then eventually they just get bored of it and they move on to the next one. That is not what God intended for your relationships. It's not. It's not. Your compatibility is gonna shift. You need to ride that wave. So you might even be thinking now, even at this point, you might be like, okay, I'm still not that shallow. I understand that I was going to have conflict with the person. I understand that there's going to be some fluctuating compatibility issues. But what about this idea of like my soul longing for something? Like I have this longing for a deep connection, this longing for a deep love, this longing for a deep fulfillment in a relationship. Is that a bad desire? And if that's a question you're asking, I want to say if you go back to this Plato story from 2,400 years ago, and, you know, and, and like I actually appreciate the idea that when he tells this story, when the human gets split, that all of these, these humans, these freaks with two arms and two legs, <laughs> have a longing. 
That's actually descriptive. I think he's right. Every human being walks around with an innate longing in their souls. I think that's real. Look at Ecclesiastes 3.11. It says, he, God, has planted eternity in the human heart. Eternity in your heart. You are incomplete. You are. You have deep longings in your soul that need some kind of satisfaction. That longing that you feel is real. That feeling of incompleteness is real. And for thousands of years, humans have been trying to solve this problem, fill that void in their soul. And the most popular way for the past 10,000 years for humans to try and fix this is with another person. We think another person can, can fix this eternity-sized canyon in our souls. So we ask another person to do it. F f help me, f fill me up, complete me. And the worst part about it is at first it works. When you first are with somebody, you do feel filled up, you do feel this warm fuzzy in your heart and it does feel like it's working. And then the initial newness wears off and the longing comes back and that's where the lie kicks in again. If this person were my soulmate, I wouldn't be longing for something else. I wouldn't have this empty feeling if they were the one. Must be somebody else. So you go through life continually searching for someone, some person to satisfy your soul. The problem is, if you look at what Ecclesiastes said, it says eternity in your heart. Eternity. A, an infinite void. You're asking another human being, hey, fill this eternity-sized canyon in my soul. That's not a fair burden to place on them. They can't do it. What's interesting to me about this is that our, our world gets the problem right and the solution wrong. We understand the question, we just don't get the answer, right? The problem, I have a void in my soul. Yep, that's the right problem. The question, what will fill this? That's also the right question. Even part of the answer, I think a relationship will solve this. You're still on the right track. And then you're like, is it a romantic a relationship? <clears throat> you're like, so close. So let me read you a really important verse, really important verse, Colossians 2:10. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. So you're incomplete until you meet Jesus. God is the only one who can fill this void in your soul. God is the only one who can satisfy your soul in a, any real and permanent and deep way. And the word complete here means to fill up, to be satisfied to the point of overflowing, which is crazy because it's, it's almost like a flex for God to say, you have an eternity-sized void in your soul. I got that. I can, I can do that. I can fill up eternity. So when you say, I feel incomplete, I feel unsatisfied, yep, you should. I think a relationship will fix it. Yes, yes. But with who? Another person, don't be ridiculous. Your desire and your longing, way bigger than that. Another human can barely scratch the surface of what you need. You need God. You need God. Jerry Maguire was wrong, man. And I know that movie came out in 1996. And here's the worst part. I said, first service, I said, that's almost 20 years ago. And somebody came up to me and said, Adam, I have bad news. That's almost 30 years ago, and I said, no, I hate you. <laughs> so I know that some of you are like, I wasn't born yet. Shut up. <laughs> and I'll actually say it's an important, the reason I bring up almost 30-year-old movies is because it's important. It actually marked a generation. When Jerry walked into that living room with all those bitter, angry women, who, what were they angry about? They were angry that that longing in their soul hadn't been fulfilled yet that they thought it was gonna get fulfilled by some man and he didn't. And it made them so mad that, it, that they didn't fulfill that void. So they're in there complaining about the fact that men didn't fill that void. And Jerry walks in 
And they all, you know, they all see it and they all know the story and how mad that Dorothy is at him and all that stuff. And he says all the stuff. And then he looks at her and he says that line, you complete me. And everybody just melts. And it reinforces that, that lie from 2,400 years ago that Plato said that there it is. There it is. Plato got him. He needed her to complete him. They found each other. And then Dorothy's like, you have me a hello. And everyone's like, oh. That reinforced the lie for an entire generation. Uh, us, uh, those of us who are elder millennials remember that movie. I mean, you, you, it, it was a, a generation defining thing. And it reinforced this lie, the lie that is still crushing us, that his soul could rest in that relationship. But uh, you, do, you do need a relationship. It's just not with, it's not with Dorothy or Jerry. It's, it's with Jesus. St. Augustine said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord. And our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. Your heart is restless until it finds its rest in God, not another person. Don't put that weight on them. They can't do it. So two things, if you're single, if you're single, I hope today freed you up. You don't have to be frozen by this idea that I gotta find one person out of eight billion that's gonna be the one. You're free, you don't have to do that. Uh, there is not one person out there. Find somebody who loves Jesus. Find somebody who, who shares that with you. Don't ask them to fill up your soul and I think you'll make it, you'll make it. If you're married, I hope if anybody had that question starting to form in their mind, maybe this person isn't the one. I hope today we shut that question down a little bit. I hope you stop saying that to yourself. It wouldn't be this hard if stop telling yourself that. That is a lie. God's not whispering that in your ear. God is not whispering. It wouldn't be this hard if. That's not God's voice. And you need to start recognizing whose voice. That isn't God. That's a little bit of you and that's a little bit of the devil telling you it wouldn't be so hard if you've married the right person and he's trying to drive a wedge between you and your spouse. Stop. Shut that down. The weird part is the Bible actually does talk about, it has some funny math in it. I don't know if you know that. When the Bible talks about relationships, it actually says one plus one equals one. Did you know that? That's what the Bible talks about when it talks about marriage. One person plus one person equals one. Two become one in a marriage. So the moment you said, I do, there you go. There's your soulmate. Got him. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, uh, he's a theologian. He actually got executed for attempting to assassinate Hitler. So good on him, I guess. Um, he had some deep thoughts on marriage. He said this, um, it's not your love that sustains the marriage, but from now on, the marriage that sustains love. And at first I was like, eh. but then I was like, ooh. He's right because there's a, uh, your love isn't static, right? You don't, you don't have this perfectly like ever increasing love for a person. It's, it goes up and down sometimes, let's be real. So in those, in those down times, it's your commitment that holds you together. It's the marriage where you said, you promised, I do. You promised till death to his part. You said all that stuff. So you're making that commitment to say, I'm gonna love a moving target here. And every, we're not gonna feel it all the time. It's gonna get hard sometimes, but we're gonna hold on. Because I said, and I promised, and I committed, so the marriage is going to sustain the love. When the love can't handle it, you're going to, you're going to hold on. And you're not going to let these lies pull you apart. God's the one who can fulfill you. God's the one who can fulfill you. Pray with me. Lord, I, I pray for the single people right now. Pray that this would be a freeing thing for them to not feel this pressure to have to find a certain person, that they would allow themselves to find their rest in you, to ask you to be the one to fulfill their soul and that that would release them from this, this burden and help them to find a good person, Lord. Not the one, but a one, a good one, if that's what they're looking for. And Lord, I pray for the married people I pray for anybody in here who's been, who's been saying that to themselves. 
It wouldn't be this hard if, oh, Lord, I pray. I pray that that would just get shut down right now. I pray your, your truth would shine in, that a sacrificial love would, would take over. I pray that they would find their satisfaction in you, find that, that longing in their soul, that they would find fulfillment in you and allow their spouse to just be their spouse. I pray that they would work through the conflict that is inevitable. I pray they would work through the lack of compatibility, which is inevitable. And I pray that they would, they would hold on to you and love that other person just like you love them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.